Well, good morning. We are, um, we're kind of taking the long view, I guess you could say, the 20,000 uh, feet, maybe the, the view of the earth from the moon kind of a thing. We're looking at the scriptures and, and we're looking at history, his story, God's story from beginning to end and how it all fits together. And so just a, a little bit of review, right? We started in the beginning. And it said, in the beginning, there is God. This is God's story. That's why we call it his story. It's God's story. He existed before what we call time, what we know time began. Um, But part of this story is that God created his beloved. He created man and woman in his image. And he created them without shame. In other words, relationally, they were good. There was nothing between them and God. Uh, They were good with God. And there was nothing between each other. They were good with each other. Um, unfortunately, at the very beginning, there is this separation, what we call sin, um, a broken relationship. Because of giving in to their appetites, their free will, right? You can't have love without free will. They gave in to their free will, to their appetites, to their desire and their pride, and they disobeyed God. And the result was the shame and blame. All of a sudden, shame came in. They didn't feel good in their relationship with God. They didn't feel good in their relationship with each other. And right away, it was somebody else's fault. And thus, we have the world we have. You wonder, have you ever asked yourself, why do we have the world we have? Well, there you go. It's right there. Shame and blame. Ever since then, the world has been marked by shame and blame. But in the midst of this, there is a promise that a Savior is going to come and take care of the enemy, that there's going to be some kind of restoration. We don't get the whole picture, but what we do begin to get a picture of is God's got a plan, and he's going to do something about it. And that's when we begin to kind of follow this story. And we see from uh, separation, it, uh, uh, we got the murder between Cain and Abel, Cain murdered Abel, and then we have the flood. Basically, we, uh, mankind, both men and women, begin to neglect God and violence increases, not just physical violence, but, but really a, a emotional and verbal and violence begins to happen. And so God floods the earth, but we see in the midst of this, God choosing one. He chooses Noah and his family. So we even see salvation in the midst of this. As we reject our beloved, we see God's faithfulness to his beloved. We specifically see this in the promise where uh, God seemingly, randomly, there, there, with no explanation, picks uh, Abram out of, out of nowhere. Now we'll find out Abram walks with God. This is the commonality. Is people who have a relationship with God, God tends to bless and use as part of his plan. But he comes to Abram and he, and he basically makes a promise. He makes a covenant. It's pretty much a one-sided covenant. It pretty much says, Abram, I'm just going to do this for you. If you trust me right now, what he does, uh, this is what I'm going to do for you. And he promises to make him a great nation, promises to bless him, he promises to make his name great, he promises to, to bless those who bless him and curse those who curse him. But then, that's all, that's all like specific to Abram. But at the end of this, the last promise, if you remember, is he says, all peoples on earth, everyone, of every tongue, of every nation, everyone will be blessed through you. And we get a hint that this hero, this savior, this Messiah that we're waiting for is going to come from this family. And so from from here on out, we actually begin to follow this family. We also, if you remember, saw uh, in the midst of this that uh, Abram uh, trusted God. He just believed God, God's word. And the Bible says it was credit to him as righteousness. It wasn't something he did. It was the fact that he believed God. We see this right in the beginning Right? We, we talked last week about the, the example of the sacrificial son where God asked Abram to, to, we know it's a test. Abram doesn't know it's a test. He asks him to sacrifice his son and he begins to obey and God stops him and provides a lamb in his place. And that's kind of what we talked about last week. All right. And so before we uh, get down into this week, let me just kind of fill in the blanks like I've done before. So between the promise and where we're going to end up this week, slavery, there's a few things that happen. First, there's this kind of romantic story. Abram has uh, a son by the name of Isaac, and uh, he wants to provide a wife for Isaac. And so uh, there's this really wonderful romantic story where a wife has gotten, her name is Rebecca. Uh, it's worth a read. I can't go through all the details, but it's, it's quite a little romance and how it kind of all works out. And then um, Isaac and his wife have two sons, Jacob 
and Esau. Esau being the oldest, they're twins. Esau uh, is, is, there's kind of this struggle about who's going who's gonna to be birthed first and, and who's the firstborn. And what we see in this is God's provincial hand. As a matter of fact, God actually tells this to Rebekah. In Genesis chapter 25, verse 23, it says this. The Lord said to her, to Rebekah, two nations are in your womb. And two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other. And the older Esau will serve the younger. Even before they're born, we see that God has a plan. And the plan's pretty large. He's talking about two two nations coming from here. And, and, And in the midst of this, we see that his hand is on Jacob, the younger, which traditionally, culturally, would not have been the case. It would have been the older. And so as the story story continues, we see the promise confirmed to Isaac. We see the the, um, Jacob is chosen. The promise is confirmed to Jacob. And then uh, in this story, Jacob, as God's blessing goes with Jacob, his name is changed to Israel. His name is changed to Israel. So when we say Israel, it comes from this single individual, as, as God blesses, whose name is changed to Israel. And he has 12 sons. One of them is Joseph. Now, Joseph is interesting because um, his story starts in Genesis chapter 37, and it doesn't end until the end of the book in Genesis 50. So to say that he's a pretty significant character is actually an understatement. It's an understatement. And in Joseph, we're going to see this picture of a suffering servant. See, up, up to now, for the most part, bad things have happened to, to folks, but, but they've been pretty much small tests. But Joseph's life is going to be pretty rough. A lot of his life is going to be pretty rough. He's born, like I said, among many brothers. He's got uh, 10 older brothers uh, but he's the favorite son. It's a typical family. Daddy picks on one, picks one kid. You know, he's he's one of the last sons. He'll have he'll have one more, but he's one of the last sons, and he he kind of does special favors for Joseph. And so it actually says that um, the other brothers are jealous. What's even worse is that God's provincial hand is on this son, is on this favorite son. For some reason, he chose Joseph. And again, we have no hint why. But Joseph, in, uh, when he's really, really young, about 17 years of age, he is given two distinct dreams. And everyone understands the interpretation of the dream. The interpretation of the dream is someday in the future, his family, first of all, the brothers are going to bow down to him, one of the youngest. Like the nerve of this guy. And then the second dream is not only his brothers, but his mother and dad are going to bow down to him. And even even his father and mother are going, come on, son. Now, the interesting thing, though, this shows the the difference in the wisdom of ages. Because what happens here is it actually says that the brothers, it turns to jealousy, but the father begins to ponder it. Maybe it is from God. And then this is kind of where we go into the suffering servant. We see this example. Joseph is faithful to his father, but you know what? His brothers sell him into slavery as a result. Joseph is faithful to the the guy who buys him. He's faithful to his master, but he's betrayed by the master's wife who lies and he's cast into jail. Joseph is faithful to the jailer and helps him run the jail but he is betrayed by two men that he helps that he should have got clemency for. You see, you just, you just kind of see the story, but all through this, what we see is on one side, we see Joseph's faithfulness, but on the other hand, we as, as looking down in history, understand God's got his hand. God is doing something here, even though quite frankly for Joseph, it's got to feel differently. I think we miss that a lot of times. Right? We, only want, we only look at the parts of the Bible where something turned really good. We forget all the other times where it was years and years and years, and it was thing after thing after thing for Joseph. And finally, there is redemption in Joseph's story. He interprets a dream, and uh, it comes to the king has a specific dream, and nobody else can interpret it. And so Joseph comes to him, is brought to him, 
And uh, Joseph goes to God, and he's able to interpret the dream, which basically says there's going to be good food for a long time and then no food for a long time. And the king says, what should we do? And Joseph comes up with a plan, and the king says, let's do that. So Joseph becomes second. All of a sudden, uh, the dream comes true. He becomes second in charge of all the land, only under Pharaoh himself. And his family is, is affected by this famine. Unknowingly, they come for food, and again, I'm trying to make a large story, make it small, but they re finally realize it's Joseph and they're reunited with him. And here's the big, here's to me the big deal, the kind of summation of all that. Of, like I said, from chapters 37 all the way through the 50, it happens in Genesis chapter 50, verse 19. Their father dies and the, and the brothers are freaking out because they think Joseph's only been kind to them because daddy was around and now it's time for justice. And they basically throw him, themselves at his mercy. Notice what Joseph says in uh, Genesis chapter 50, starting in verse 19. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Notice how Joseph views the unrighteousness that's happened to him in his life, the wickedness that's happened to him through his life. He sees it through the lens of God. He says, you intended to harm me. And by the way, this is clearly their motivation. He doesn't undermine their motivation. He doesn't make, well, I, well, you didn't know any better. No, he says, you intended to harm me. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. From the outside looking in, it looked terrible, but God had an intention all along. He saved our family through this. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. And he followed through. See, amidst hardship, God is faithful. And there is a plan. And then that brings us to Exodus chapter 1, our, our, where we're going to pick up today. Exodus chapter 1, starting in verse 8. So the whole family moves down into Egypt. And they begin, they're obviously blessed because Joseph is second in command. But Exodus chapter 1, verse 8 says this, Then a new king, who did not know about Joseph, Joseph has died, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. I don't have time to go into it, but um, this is Jewish history. They've been invited into many countries uh, over the centuries uh, to help. And they do help. And as soon as things turn good, they're turned into the bad guys. And then they're persecuted. This is, it, it, I'm, I'm not saying one way or the other. I'm just saying this is history, even modern history. Picking up in verse 11. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them, and they forced labor, and they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with hard labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their hard labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly." So, so in the overall picture, you know how we say these, as we bottom out here in the picture, it's, it's about mankind rejecting the beloved. In this case, it's not God's people. Usually, by the way, a lot of times it is God's people. But in this case, it's not God's people who have sinned. But they are the victims of others who have rejected God's goodness who have rejected the beloved. And in this case, it's, it's the ruling class. It's Pharaoh and, his, and the leadership. And they are victims of this. And again, I, I, this is important for us because um, what we want to believe is that in this life and time, if you're God's kid, everything just goes smoothly. That's not in the Bible. That's not part of the story. Sometimes, yes, and we'll see this. God will turn things around. But don't miss the parts. Here we have God's family, his chosen family. And they're victims of the fallen world around them. But in the, even in the midst of this, though, we see God's hand. 
What Pharaoh does is he comes up with a plan. He says they're, they're, they're increasing too much. And so at first he tries to be crafty. He goes to the midwives. Um, so all the professionals are obviously Egyptians. That's how you keep a people down. You keep them just doing basic labor and all the folks that have any kind of skill is, is somebody else. So the midwives are all Egyptian. And so the Pharaoh says, hey, when you're going and, and taking care of babies, right? If it's female, let it live. But if it's a male, figure out a way to kill it. It kind of in secret kind of thing. But it says, the, but even the midwives, it says, feared God. So we got, see God's hand provision. We see his provision. And so Exodus chapter one, it says this. So God was kind to the midwives. He was kind to them because they stood up and said, we won't do this. And the people increased and became even more numerous. Because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. He blessed them, right? And that was, by the way, remember, that was part of the promise to Abram, Abraham, right? I will bless those who bless you. And here we see it. Verse 22, though, then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. If I can't do, accomplish this through the midwives, they came up with a story, man. The Hebrew women are just like so strong. They have their babies before we can even get there. And so Pharaoh comes up with another plan. Every boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. And he, he just, he's overt now. And so every boy is hunted down and is killed. Horrific genocide. In the midst of this, though, this, this horrificness, we still see God's hand, and it, and it focuses on one family, a, a family of, of there's, there's 12, and one of the guys is named Levite. It's from his family. They have a child that is born, and they hide this child successfully for three months, but around three months, it's impossible. And so they're scared for not only their child's life, but actually they're scared for their own life as well. And so we don't know why. I, I'm, part of me is like they can't hide him in the house anymore. So they decide maybe if we hide him down by the river, then if somebody finds him, right, then it's just him. But if they don't find him, then we can come and take care of him and we'll just see what happens. I, I don't know. It doesn't really say. It just says that she did a basket. She made it so it can float, put the baby in the basket and put it on the river. And the interesting thing is sister decided to watch. I guess she felt safe because she was a little girl and who was going to say anything? And so along comes Pharaoh's own daughter. They're walking along a path along the river and they hear this noise and she sends one of her servants down and she brings them and says, it's one of the Hebrew babies. And, and they know what's supposed to happen. The Hebrew baby's supposed to be thrown in the Nile, which is interesting because that's where they found the baby. The very place it's supposed to be thrown. And she decides to keep the child. Now, here's the cool thing. She sees this Hebrew girl and says, hey, you, come here. I need some help. Look at verse 7 of chapter 2. Then his sister, the baby's sister, asked Pharaoh's daughter, hey, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. And the girl went and got the baby's mother. And so now Pharaoh's daughters ordered her, ma'am, you have to take care of this child and nurse it and love it and its own mother. Again, in the midst of hardship, God is faithful. Now, I, I would remind you, while we rejoice in this, I would remind you that there are hundreds of mothers at this time and that are still losing their babies. I, I, don't, want you, I don't want us to lose fact that God, God is still moving, but that doesn't mean that, that, the, that sin, that brokenness isn't still hurting and prevalent in this time. It is. But in the midst of this, we see God's hand. And the son uh, uh, is raised by his mother. He's called Moses by Pharaoh's daughter. He gives him an, an Egyptian name. And she raises him. He's raised in the household. But he's raised, I, yeah, you've probably seen several versions of the story. And he's kind of raised as like an equal. And he might reign. And the other one might reign. And that's all Hollywood, okay? Moses knew that he was a Hebrew slave. 
he was just a Hebrew slave, kind of as an adopted son, but he had no rank. He knew that those were my people. There was, there was no, like, aha moment. He was, from day one, those are my people, and these are just the folks that I'm raised with. But he is raised he, in the culture, and, and, and he, uh, he, he's exposed to the leadership structure and all that kind of stuff. But he so identifies with his people, one day he's out as a young man, and he sees a, a specific uh, Egyptian uh, slave master just mercilessly beating what, what he views as his people. And he gets angry, and he actually kills one, kills this Egyptian uh, master. And it becomes known, and so he flees. He flees, and he comes across seven daughters who are in, in uh, trouble. They're trying to get the water for their animals, and some punks come along and try to chase them away. And in comes Moses. Again, this, this is kind of a cool movie scene right here. In come Moses, and he chases the guys away, gives them water. He ends up part of this family, actually ends up marrying one of the, the daughters named Zipporah. Now, while this is all happening, we're following, we're following this story. While this is all happening, right, it says this, chapter 2, verse 23. During that long period, in other words, this didn't just happen overnight. Meanwhile, there's still bitterness going on back in Egypt. The king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and they cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. That promise, I will, I will bless you, that, that promise, I'm going to do this no matter what. So God looked on the Israelites and he was, notice, concerned about them. Now, this is a summary statement. The truth is, he's been concerned, he's heard these prayers for a really long time. This entire time, even before Moses was even born, he just chose this moment. It's ripe to act. See, God's timing is not our own. And the world we live in, it, that, that, that blame and shame continues and it has real consequences. It doesn't always have a happy ever ending in this life. But that doesn't mean God doesn't have a plan that he's not moving in a way that we can't see because that's exactly what happens. And the interesting thing is God hears them. He has compassion on them and he has an answer. They don't know it. No one would see it coming. It was all behind the scenes. It's Moses. And so, so this, the story moves in, you know, kind of gives us Moses' background and we understand God's hand is on his life. So far, he hasn't shown anything why it would be on his life. It just, it is. And then God calls Moses. He calls the one his hand has been on, even though Moses did not, does not know this. And Moses, or probably anybody else who knew anything about Moses, would have necessarily picked him. But God knew what was happening. And so God comes to Moses. This is the burning bush. Again, I don't have time to go through all this, but this is the burning bush where he encounters God and God speaks to him after the burning bush. Verse seven of Exodus three, it says, the Lord said, I've indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers and I'm concerned about their suffering. Now, let's just stop right there, verse seven. Moses at this point has gotta be going, it's about time. That's good, God, awesome, wonderful. I'm glad you, because that was, remember that's what, why he killed that guy in the first place and had to run because he saw that and it moved his heart and he thought something, need, something needs to be done. The world's falling apart. God, do something. And God says, I'm going to. And he says, great. And then verse 10, so now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And this is where Moses goes, whoa, whoa. If you read on in, in Exodus uh, uh, chapter three, you'll see this interesting discussion between God and Moses where Moses is basically trying to get out of this deal. He first asks, God, who am I? In other words, uh, I'm not qualified. And interesting, God's answer isn't you're qualified. God's answer is I will be with you. It's not who you are, it's who I am. 
And then, and then Moses is like, well, who, who do I tell them is sending me? I mean, it's just, this is, this is kind of a weird deal. And this is where God gives him the I am, I am. In other words, basically he's saying, saying uh, I'm immeasurable. You can't really tell them who I am. But then you can tell them this. I'm the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, we have a history. I had promised them. I'm the God who said from day one that I would be with them and that I was going to do this. Tell them that's who I am. And then, and then Moses is like, well, why would they believe me? That's his third question. Why would they believe me? And God says, I'll tell you what, I'll give you three miracles, right? This is where the, the staff turns into a snake. It's his hand, he puts in his cloak, it comes out lepro- with leprosy in the back and it's disappeared and tells him about the water he can take from the Nile and pour on the ground that'll turn to blood, right? God's answering each of these questions. And then Moses goes back to, listen, I'm not gifted. I'm slow with speech. I can barely, you want me to go talk? I can't even talk. I have a stuttering problem. Man, how, many times have, how many times has someone come up to you and said, hey, I think it'd be great in this ministry. And your first reaction was, well, I can't do that because. That's exactly Moses' thing. Rather than, you know what our first reaction should be? Let me check with God. Because quite frankly, God doesn't really care about our stutter or our schedule or our experience. Why? Because it's him that's going to do it, not us. And this is where God basically answered when he says, you know, I, I, I I have a sleeping, God's like, okay, excuse me, who made who? Why are you telling me what you can't do? I made you. I will help you speak. It's not about you, Moses, it's about me. And then finally, Moses gets to it. Finally, the fifth thing, if you read this, Moses just says, I don't want to do it, get someone else. And it actually says, it says that God gets angry. He says, first of all, he says, I'm going to give you Aaron. But basically, he just says, listen, I'm authoritatively saying, go. Period. End of story. You're going to do it. And then we see God's plan to save his people. It begins to unfold. After Moses' call, it begins to unflow. See, God wants, in his plan, it's really interesting. He wants to deliver free his people, but it's so much bigger than that. He wants them to see his power. He wants to see how much he, he cares and that he is their God and that, and that there's no better relationship to be in. There's no, no one else other than him to be connected to. And so in the midst of this, he's going to make a statement so great that it echoes down through the ages. It won't be just they that understand that God is their God and, he, and they are his people. It's from the ages on, this is going to echo down. And he tells Moses this up front. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 21, it says this, And the Lord said to Moses, When you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. In other words, Moses, I'm going to do amazing things. But notice the next sentence. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. I couldn't imagine God coming to me and saying, saying, Hey, Pastor Joel, you know what? You are going to preach amazing sermons. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and do amazing things. And your church isn't going to grow at all. I'm going to make sure it doesn't grow. I'm going to make sure no one hears you. I'm going to, I'm, I'd be like, what? And that's basically what he's telling Moses. All these wonderful things you're going to do, but I just want you to know up front, in the beginning, it ain't going to work. It's part of my plan. Frustrating, isn't it? Think about your life. How many times you're like, God, why isn't this going anywhere? Maybe you don't have those kind of conversations with God, but I have them all the stinking time. (laughs) What is wrong, God? I mean, it seems like, I mean, I see your hand here and here, but it's not going anywhere. And and part of it is I have this assumption that when I see his hand, it's all just going to be happily ever after. I've read so much Disney, seen so much Disney. I I really do believe that's the way my life should turn out. But that's not what the story points to. So Moses approaches the people and he he shows them the signs. And initially they believe and worship God. By the way, they're going to turn against him. Because when he goes to to, uh, Pharaoh and says, let my people go, right? Pharaoh just makes their work harder. His heart is hardened. He just makes their heart. And then the people come to Moses and go, who are you? What did you do? They completely forgot, you know, that God is great. And he was going to, it's just like, they just flip. This, this plan of yours didn't work. We thought if we all gathered together and praised on Wednesday night, you know, that God would do this for our church and it didn't happen. 
by golly, pastor, you know, what's wrong? Come up with a better plan. It's exactly what they do with Moses. And then God shows his power through 10 plagues, right? You're probably familiar with this. Water turned into blood, frogs, lice, flies, livestock disease, boils, hail, locusts, the whole darkness. And the interesting thing is most of these only happen to the Egyptians. They don't happen to where, to where the, the Jews are. They're, they got their own little section. It's away from the main part, if you would. But this last one affects everyone. God is allowing an, an angel of death. We don't know much about it other than it's called the angel of death who's going to come to every household and the first born of every household, whether it be a human or whether it be an animal, is going to die. But God tells Moses to tell the people, this won't happen to you if you do this. Here's the instructions. Kill a lamb. It's got to be under a year old. Kill a lamb. Take the blood of that lamb and put it on the doorposts of your home. And then go inside and wait this evening. And when the angel of death came, come, it went to every single household, including the, ha- the, the household of, the, of these 12 families of the Israelites. And every household that did not have the blood of the lamb, it went in and it killed the firstborn and the firstborn animal. And then go to the next one. But if it had the blood of the lamb on the doorposts, and there, by the way, there's some context that suggests that there's actually some Egyptians that did this as well. It would pass over that house and go to the next one. And then, of course, Pharaoh's own son dies in this, and this is where he is broken. And he lets the people go. And there's great jubilation. But but in the midst of this jubilation, it points to something amazing. That God wants them to remember. It's the first time that God says, stop. I just did something. I don't never want you to forget this. This is going to be something I want you to remember every single year. Now, if you're reading along, again, if you're, just, if you're reading a story or whatnot and, and the author takes the time to go, stop, remember, something's got to go, clue, important. This is what it says in Exodus chapter 13. Then Moses said to the people, commemorate, remember, mark, put a stake in it. Commemorate this day, the day you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand. Eat nothing containing yeast. Yeast, by the way, we're going to find out later, uh, often represents sin. Today in the month of Abib, you are leaving. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, that's the promised land he promised Abraham, the land he swore to your forefathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey. When that happens, you are to observe this ceremony in this month. For seven days, eat bread made without yeast. And on the seventh day, hold a festival to the Lord. Eat unleavened bread during those seven days. Nothing with yeast in it is to be seen among you, nor shall any yeast be seen anywhere within your borders. On that day, I tell your son, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. Notice that for centuries, they're going to tell their sons, when I came out of Egypt, they never came out of Egypt. Other than that generation, from every generation. But he says, 100 years from now, 200 years from now, 2,000 years from now, you're to turn to your children and said, when I came out of Egypt, and let's make this personal. This is your story. He says, this observance will be for you like a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord is to be on your lips. For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with his mighty hand. You must keep this ordinance at the appointed time, year after year after year. And this is the beautiful thing. We've been saying this every time. Here we are in slavery at a low point for God's people. And what does it do? It points to the cross. 
it points to, go ahead and show the map or whatever we're calling it. Yeah. The, it points to that reconciliation. The ultimate Passover where death passes over God's people. Why? Because of the blood of the lamb. Every year since this time, those who've considered themselves Jewish people have been celebrating this. Then we're going to do the same today, but I want you to see the connection between what the Jews have been celebrating. The worship team, you guys can come on up. I want you to see the connection between what the Jews celebrated and what we celebrate today. And so we're going to do it this way. Um, I'm going to have, uh, if the ushers would go ahead and grab the bread. We're going to sing a song together. And during the song, the ushers are going to hand out the bread. Just hold on to it. Two things. Stay seated. I know a lot of times we stand for music. This time, stay seated. And number two, hold on to the bread. Because I want you to see the connection, the beautiful connection between how the Israelites have been celebrating this now for centuries, for millennials and our Savior. Let's worship together. So God tells them to commemorate. Commemorate God's redemption is what it says. And so I, I just want to talk a little bit about when we take the bread, when we take what we call communion. It has its origin in this in this historical account. He tells uh, his people to commemorate every year, and, and they, they do. They still today, if you have any Jewish friends, when it, when it comes time around what we call Easter, when it comes around that time, there, there is a specific date on there, there by the lunar calendar, which is why it moves around. And the 15th of Nisan is when they commemorate and they do this thing, if you, if you ever get invited uh, to one, or sometimes we even have something like this here, they call it a Seder. And Seder literally means order. There's a specific order. At the center of that is the Seder plate. And it has different things, and it's all about commemorating. It has a couple of uh, bitter herbs. Because uh, in, in Numbers chapter 9, verse 11, it says, they are to celebrate it on the 14th day of the second month of twilight. They are to eat the lamb together with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. It commands them. Those are the three things. The lamb, which is sacrificed. It's taken to the temple and sacrificed. They are to eat bitter herbs. And they are to, and they are to eat unleavened bread. And so on this, on this plate, there's the bitter herbs. There's the shank bone. That, that represents the lamb. They don't sacrifice the lamb anymore. Why? The temple is gone. Shortly after Jesus. And there's some other things that represent spring. And there's the, the parsley where you dip it in, in salted water to represent the tears. And they basically tell the story that we just talked about. The other element is on the table. Even today, there are three loaves of bread of unleavened. Actually, they're not loaves because it's unleavened. We call it matzah. If you go to a, a Jewish Seder, as they go through the specific order, sometime in the beginning, they will pull out the middle of these three. By the way, you can call around to uh, different rabbis at different synagogues and ask them, why three praises of, of unleavened bread? And there's no consensus on it. But one of the, the, the main things is it, it represents the three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What they'll do is they'll break the middle one and then they'll hide it away. We, uh, we celebrated this, this last year with Liat and Greg in their home and hid it away. And then you kind of go on with your thing. And this, I call it the Afikoman. Well, how, do you, how do you pronounce it, Liat? Afikoman. All right. She has a better pronunciation. If you want to know how it's pronounced, ask Liat. <laughs> and then you, and then you kind of go on. And then you have dinner, and then after dinner, someone goes and finds this, and they partake. 
Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says this. Paul says, this is, this, remember this thing that we do ever, when we gather together called communion? He says, for I received from the Lord. In other words, this didn't come secondhand. This came from Jesus. When Jesus came to me, this is what Jesus told me. This came, for though I received from the Lord what I also pass on you, the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed. Remember, this is that last supper. Took bread. Now, this Last Supper, by the way, they were celebrating the Passover. They were going through this order. They had taken the middle piece. They had broken it. They had had dinner, and then, and then they came back. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In essence, when this middle piece, remember I told you the best guess is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Isn't it interesting that it was Isaac who was supposed to be sacrificed, but God stopped him? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Son was broken. And it was that piece of bread, unleavened bread, that Jesus said, take, eat. Why? This isn't some random piece of unleavened bread. This represents me. I am the lamb that will be sacrificed. I am the one to be broken for the forgiveness of your sins. So now, brothers and sisters, take the unleavened bread and with me eat in remembrance of our Savior. There's another central part of this dry mouth now. Matzah's not very... Before we go on that, we're going to pass out the cup during this next song as we worship again. Stay seated and hold on to the cup, and I'll explain it when we're done. So we're commemorating. The Jewish people are commemorating God's redemption throughout the ages, thousands of years, even to this day. So in this order... Not only do they take bitter herbs, which reminds them of the bitterness, and they, and they retell the story, and they do this when the unleavened bread. But all, during this time, they have four cups of wine. And interesting enough, they know exactly why they have four cups of wine. They're, the whole idea is to commemorate what happened. And in the, in the beginning of this, is this is captured in Exodus, uh, uh, the story there are four things that God says that he is going to do for his people. It's found in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. It says this, Therefore say to the Israelites, this is what Moses is supposed to say to them, I am the Lord and I will bring you out, first I will, from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you, second, from being slaves to them. I will redeem you, third, with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. And I will take you as my own people, the fourth I will. And I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And for centuries and now, if you, if you go to a Seder, if you go to a, 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 a Passover, if you would, you will get a cup at your, at your spot of wine, though if you have folks in recovery, it's grape juice. And somewhere along the line, they'll, they'll come to the first cup, which is known as the cup of deliverance. That's the, I will, bring, I will bring you out. And everybody will drink that one cup. And then you go on, pour another one. And then you come to the cup of freedom. I will free you, and everybody will drink that. You pour another one. Pause for dinner. Then right after dinner, there's the third cup, the cup of redemption. You drink that, you fill it up again. And then the last cup is the cup of hope. I will take you as my own people and you drink that. Now again, they've been celebrating. This has been codified. They've been doing this for centuries. It's, in, it's, it's not only in the, in the uh, tradition, but it's in the, the Talmud. Uh, not the Talmud, the Mishnah. Jewish special writings. This is how you're supposed to do this. And even today, if you go, that's how it's done. Again, Jesus is with his disciples. They're celebrating the Passover. What does 1 Corinthians chapter 11 go on to say? In the same way, just like he took the bread, in the same way, after, notice this word, supper, he took the cup. 
So what do we know? It's the third cup. Why? Because that's where we always drink the third cup. When we celebrate the Seder, we always drink the third cup after dinner. After dinner, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant. It's a new agreement. It's a new promise in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you will proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. At that moment on, rather than celebrating the Passover, we celebrate, well, we still celebrate the Passover. But we don't just go, we don't go to Egypt, we go to Jesus. Because he's the lamb. And if you drink the cup in faith that it was his blood spilt for you, then on the, if you would, the doorpost of your heart, this represents the blood of Jesus. And so at the end, when eternal death comes, eternal separation from God comes, the angel of death passes over because we're covered by the blood of the Lamb. See, to this day, the, the Jewish people see this ceremony as just a reflection on when they became a nation and God's faithfulness to them. They don't understand how the whole story is connected. It was always about God and His beloved, always. And his beloved needs to be redeemed, just like he saved Noah, just like he promised Abraham. Right here in the midst of slavery, he shows that he would send a lamb. And so brothers and sisters in Christ, for those of you who believe, rather than putting blood on the doorpost of your home, I invite you now to take the cup, remembering that it was Christ's blood that's poured out, that the new covenant is by faith faith, you are saved through him. You drink with me. As we uh, go out from this place, I just, I just want to say, I don't, I don't know what the story of your life looks like. I don't know what your week looked like. I had some great stresses. I did some things well. I messed up horribly on some other things. I just want to encourage you when we look at his story, when we look at the Bible, God's ultimate goal isn't that you get it all together. His ultimate goal isn't it all ends in this life happily ever after. His ultimate goal is to bring his people back into himself. And so if you stand, this is the blessing I like to ask as we go from this place. I, I pray, I ask God to bless us with just a glimpse this week that his plan of redemption is running through our lives despite your circumstances. Go walk in the love of the beloved in the way of our master, Jesus Christ. God bless. We'll see you all next week.